Good evening, and, and thank you so much for being here. Um, today, uh, I'm Laksh, by the way, and, and this is Vidu. Um, so I actually ended my last year's RSA talk at the DevSecOps um, sessions with this quote. Um, security is actually proto-science, AppSec more so. We don't have all the answers. If we did, we all wouldn't be here. And if anyone pretends that they have all the answers, just run away from them. Um, what I can tell is that let's all take a very scientific approach to solving security and try different things, see what works, keep it, and discard what doesn't. All right, great. So with that said, um, I'm gonna dive into a quick introduction and set some context on what this presentation is all about. This is a case study of, about the deployment of SCOREBOT, which stands for Secure Code Review Bot at PayPal. I did not come up with the name. All the credit should go to Vidu. Uh, pretty creative there. Um, it, it's, 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 it's not a silver bullet. We're not saying that it's gonna solve all your security problems, um, but we're just sharing what worked for us. And it's completely vendor neutral in case I mention any vendor names. It's not an endorsement, it's, it's more of uh, more of a habit, uh, and definitely not a sales pitch for that. And it's purely descriptive. I'm going to explain, uh, and you know, we're going to showcase what 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 we did, what worked, what were the results, what were some of the challenges, and stuff like that. And it, it, by no way it's prescriptive, because if if you try to do this, a lot of it depends on your um, infrastructure, more, more importantly, culture uh, of the organization. So your mileage may may vary. All right, so uh, quick agenda. Uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna start out with a quick overview of secure product lifecycle at PayPal, and then we're gonna talk about our landscape and kind of give you an overview of our problem statement. Then um, we're gonna uh, dive into the design of what Scorebot is, and then the real meat uh, of the presentation, which is, the, which is a live demo. We're, we're gonna attempt a live demo. Um, a lot of variables at play, but we're going to try it, uh, and then uh, and then uh, show what are what were the benefits, what was the ROI on this. All right, so secure product lifecycle at PayPal's objective is to reduce the number of vulnerabilities in our products over time, not overnight, over time, by building repeatable, sustainable, proactive security practices that are embedded seamlessly within our product life cycle. So with that objective, uh, we, we obviously do a bunch of different things. So it, it, it's a combination of best of the breed security tooling, processes, training, both traditional and non-traditional, uh, and, and a combination of all of that um, actually makes up our secure product life cycle program at PayPal. All right, so let's, let, let's look at our landscape. Um, so for, for, for this presentation, uh, we're just looking at our core product development organization. Obviously, as you may know, we have a lot of acquisitions and other brands, so the, the, we're gonna leave them out of, out of scope for now. Just looking at our core product development organization, which is basically PayPal.com and all of the mobile apps and, and, and the infrastructure that goes around that. We have over 4,000 developers, um, a bunch of different custom application frameworks uh, on top of which our developers build our applications. Uh, diverse programming languages, we, we still run uh, a CGI bin C++ uh, web app. Uh, and, and we also run Node.js uh, at the same time. And what are the problems we're trying to solve here, right? One of the key challenges is when a code review happens, it's more around coding styles, functionalities, um, things of that nature. But how, what about security? We definitely want to bring security to the table when somebody submits a pull request and the submitter and the reviewer get together and look at the, look at the code and, and review it. And the other big thing we're trying to solve here is there, there are generic technical security flaws. Think of cross-site scripting, SQL injection, CSRF, things of that nature. We're not talking about that. We're talking about 
PayPal-specific vulnerabilities. What do I mean by that? We have, as I mentioned earlier, custom frameworks, libraries, APIs, things like that. And, and there is a possibility that there could be vulnerabilities in them. Some of them could be deprecated, and we want our developers to use the latest and greatest. Um, and so PayPal-specific issues, things, you know, uh, issues in our logging platforms and APIs, crypto platforms and APIs, stuff like that. And also, things are things that are not technically vulnerabilities, but just deviations uh, from our internal security standards. So we want to we want to catch them and flag them as well. And obviously, it it everybody knows that we got to shift left and provide feedback early. And and IDE plugins or spell checkers, as, as, as some would like to talk about. They are a great idea, it, it works for a lot of companies, um, but for us, it, it was just, we, we tried, and it's incredibly complex um, to maintain an update at scale. I have diverse programming languages, I have diverse set of IDEs. I, we actually have developers who use VI and Emacs. Um, we do as one of them. Uh, and, and ranging from that to WebStorm to Eclipse uh, and so on. So when you have multiple different IDEs, multiple versions of each IDEs, and then you have plugins and plugin compatibility issues, and, and it just gets messy over time. So if you want a consistent results across the board, it just wasn't working out for us. So we wanted a solution wherein we can shift left, left as much as we can and provide early feedback to our developers. And the other thing we were trying to solve for is when we know about a vulnerability from the point of identification and the point at which we have a rule in our CICD pipeline that actually starts flagging that for all new development, we want to compress that timeline. When, when we try to do that with static analysis tools, you've got to write custom rules. That's, that's the only way to do it. And you want to do the custom rules, it takes time. You've got to figure out what, how to do it, and then you test it, and, and there will be false positives, you go back and tweak it. And by the time you end up scaling it across the board, it's too long. It's, it's weeks, if not days. And so we want to get to a point where it's actually in a matter of minutes or hours, we want to be able to identify something and then get something into the CICD pipeline as soon as possible so that we can start flagging new issues going forward. And so static analysis tools were pretty heavy and then maintaining and customizing and keeping them up to date across version upgrades was just too messy. So that's the landscape, that's the problem statement. That's what we're solving for here. All right, so what, what we're, we, with this context set, what should be our guiding principles? How, how should we approach this problem, right? The, the movie, um, any fans of The Matrix here? I'm one. All right, quite a few, quite a few fans. Um, the, the movie may be about 20 years old, uh, but one line that really stuck with me um, is never send a human to do a machine's job. Uh, it, uh, yeah, Agent Smith is one of my favorite characters. Um, and so, so here are our guiding principles. Number one, it's got to be developer friendly. What do I mean by that? Like, developers should not have to learn a new tool, install something, configure something, remem remember to use it, um, that's just a non-starter. You gotta put your boss to work and you gotta put your boss to work in the right way. And uh, more importantly, we have to be empathetic to developers. Our, our entire engineering org is, is actually a bunch of developers and who, who are now security engineers. And so we're really, really empathetic to the developer way of life. And the next thing is we want to solve for scale. Obviously, as I said, said earlier, we actually do hundreds of deployments to, the, to our production site every day. And uh, we, we have hundreds of components and across diverse um, programming languages and, and application frameworks. So we got to solve for scale. So that, that's very evident. And at the same time, performance is important too. We want to be able to get the response back to our developers, provide early feedback in a matter of seconds and not a matter of minutes or hours. That's, that's, that's too slow. So we have to be absolutely performant. Then comes behavioral science. My personal aha moment about behavioral science was, 
uh, if I remember correctly, it's back in 2011. So what we did was we actually built a small online trading module for our developers, and we sent that to a bunch of product teams. And the click-through rate for that was abysmal. And we were scratching our heads going, why aren't developers clicking that? Why aren't they using that? And then we, we made just one change in the email campaign, just one change. We added how long was the uh, online training module. It was like four minutes and 32 seconds or something like that, and we just added that, and we sent out another set of emails to another product group. And the click-through rate was pretty high. It was like, what's going on here? So when, when the, the developers saw the email, they did not know how long was the trading module. Maybe it was 30 minutes, maybe it was an hour. They were not ready to come into it. But it was like four minutes, I can come into that. And so many people clicked through, they actually took that uh, online training course, or a module. So that was, was eye-opening. So developers, they are the ones that are writing the code, they are building the products, and in the process, they are the ones that are introducing the vulnerabilities. So if we wanna change their behavior, how do we nudge them? How do we remind them at the right time if they're doing something wrong and about to shoot themselves in the foot? So behavioral science was a, was a very important piece for me. And to make that happen, we wanted to bring experimentation as a core feature uh, of, of Scorebot. What, what do I mean by experimentation is, is in the traditional sense, being able to do A-B testing. So if you find a vulnerability, one set of emails and notifications would have a different verbiage, another set of have different verbiage, and then we can compare and see what worked and discard what doesn't work and pick the ones that work. Maybe a, a set of things that we show for a product team that has native speakers of English who are located here in the Bay Area versus a set of developers who are in China who, who's, whose who English is actually not their na native language, not their first language. And so is there a difference? If you, we don't know, let's try it out. So this provided us opportunities to run different campaigns and see different results and we stuck with what works and we could discard what doesn't work. All right, with that said, uh, I'm gonna turn it over to Vidu. Um, Vidu's gonna provide a high level overview of the design and uh, talk and, and actually uh, attempt to do a live demo. All right, over to you Vidu. Um, can you guys hear me? All right, uh, thank you, Laksh. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, all right, so what you're seeing here on the screen is the representation of the high-level design of Scorebot. And um, as part of PayPal CI-CD pipeline integration, when a developer creates a pull request to obviously merge this local code to the parent repository, Scorebot will receive the new code via an asynchronous hook and that'll be used as a payload that'll be scanned for PayPal-specific vulnerabilities. Now, we record a lot of um, metrics associated with the PR, uh, all of the metadata that we will use it later. And if an insecure code is identified by Scorebot in that PR, Scorebot will comment in the PR containing information like what vulnerability is detected, where is it present in the code, because the PR might contain a lot of files, so we specifically tell where that vulnerability is. And we also summary, summarize what is the security issue in the context of the code, and most importantly, how to fix it. Now, there will be also document references with more details on the findings, and step-by-step -step instructions on how to fix it. And, and my developers love it. Of all the things that we give it to them, they like the step-by-step -step instructions. And, and in, in addition to the PR comment, an email notification with all of this information will be uh, sent to the developer as well. Now, all of these tasks will be done in near real time from the moment the PR is initiated. And uh, that's the performance guidance that we kind of take very seriously. And uh, there is nothing the developer has to remember to invoke or manually integrate everything from an application perspective to trigger Scobot. All right, um, enforcement with empathy. This is one of my favorite lines uh, when I want to talk about the enforcement topic. If you can buy it, you generally don't have to. Um, so I've been a developer myself uh, for a long time before transitioning to a security engineer, as Laksh mentioned. As a matter of fact, a vast majority of our PayPal AppSec engineering organization is, is folks like that. Uh, so when it comes to enforcement, we are absolutely empathetic to our developers. and. 
always try to balance both security and developer experience. Well, almost always. All right, so this is the representation of the enforcement and waiver flow. And as you can see, when the pull request with the insecure code is identified by scorebot, in addition to the PR comment and the email notification that's being sent out, the merge button in the pull request will be disabled. And this is done to encourage the developer to go and fix the code before merging. Now, in line with the enforcement with empathy philosophy, the developer will have an option to initiate a waiver from within the context of the PR comment that will re-enable the merge button in real time. Uh, but for critical risk findings, uh, security team retains the power to block releases that are associated uh, with this commit. So that is covered, and only so much for the empathy part there. All right, so um, I think, uh, let's see if anybody's interested in seeing the demo, Laksh. All right, as Vidu is trying to set up uh, for the demo, I just want to come clean and say that's a completely out of context quote. Nuno is a musician. Uh, and, and full disclosure, we actually have a recorded version of the demo just in case the demo gods don't bless us today. Uh, there's a lot of variables there, VPN, connection over a, a wireless internet and things of that nature. So, all right, over to you, Vidu. All right, can everybody uh, see the screen? All right, cool. Um, okay, this is not really a comfortable desktop, I mean, setup, but I'm gonna try my best. All right, so I'm gonna use a piece of code here which is insecure because uh, it uses a deprecated PayPal crypto utility, which is uh, PP Crypt Utils. So I'm gonna hopefully trigger this uh, code to trigger Scobot and see if it can identify and tell me what the problem is. And, and before I do that, I wanna uh, quickly demonstrate the fact that uh, we should shift left as much as possible. So what I'm gonna try and do here is even before the PR is initiated, I'm gonna trigger the Scobot scan here, which is just in my local Mac. And this is possible because uh, we have a tool called DevRunner, which operationalizes our entire PayPal's uh, CI-CD uh, pipeline integrations uh, by automating a lot of test suites, uh, including unit tests, functional tests, and of course, uh, security scans. So I'm gonna go and type in that command. All right, so DR stands for DevRunner, by the way. Uh, but if I had to, if I were to uh, execute this command right now, uh, it's gonna uh, trigger the suite of uh, security scans, which includes static analysis, dynamic analysis, software composition analysis, and of course, Scobot, but in the interest of time, I'm gonna force it to run only Scobot. All right. And hopefully it'll uh, identify the uh, issue of the file, and I think it does. Identified. So the PP Crypt tools, which is deprecated, is in part of this file. Now, it also has more details here in, in Scoreboard Warning TXT, but I'm not going to open that file because I'm going to show that in the PR. So let's go ahead and commit this change locally. All right, I'm going to push this change. So what I'm doing right now is just, as a developer, just committing this change local uh, to my repository. All right, so hopefully, yeah, I mean, I'm seeing that file now, so I'm gonna initiate a pull request. All right, so as you can see, the file is here, and my deprecated utility is here, so I'm gonna create a pull request. All right, drum roll. Hopefully it'll work. There you go. So, Scobart was kicked in without developer lifting a finger, other than just creating the pull request, of course. And, and the checks have all failed, and Scobot has commented in real time in the PR, and the commit has been set as failure status. So it gives you details about what the issue is, and also very specific to the context of the code, and what file has that issue, and how to fix it. And it also has more details and step-by-step -step instructions which can be used by the developer to fix it. Now, we talked about enforcement, right? So the merge button in the PR is now disabled. Uh, but there are you know, extraordinary circumstances where a developer is fixing a P1 issue or something like that, of that nature, so he would probably wanna go and merge the code. So here comes the empathy part, 
um, he'll be able to just click this link and just mention why he wants to get a waiver. All right, so it says this is an emergency P1 bug fix, and we will fix this issue in the next sprint. Now that really sounds like a developer, right? <laughs> okay. So now the exception is um, submitted. Let's go and see what happened to the pull request. All right, as you can see, the commit has been changed to success status in real time. There you go. And then the merge button is now re-enabled. So the developer has all the you know, possibility to go and merge this code and you know, take that code to the production. And uh, that brings to the end of the demo. Over right. to you. Great. Thank you, Vidu. Thank you. Wasn't that cool? Yeah. Awesome. So as Vidu mentioned earlier, if it, if it were a critical security violation, if it were a critical security vulnerability, this was just a band function, a deprecated API, not a big deal. They can always upgrade at a later point. Um, if it were a critical one, we have the commit ID associated with it, and when the deployment happens, when they push the button to deploy, we, can, we have the ability to block them for critical violations. So that's how you balance security and agility. All right, so this is all good stuff. What was the ROI? Show me the money, right? Um, and, and, and you know, good feedback from developers is all good. Um, anecdotal evidence is all good, but, but the plural of anecdote is not data. We, we want to see some hard data from it, like what was the ROI. So l let me get to that. But first, let me, let me give you the, uh, the anecdote first. So from an AppSec team, uh, team's perspective, we now have end-to-end -end visibility for PayPal specific vulnerabilities across the board, across different stacks. So now we can start to see certain patterns emerge. Maybe there's a product team that is really bad at upgrading certain security modules or upgrading the latest version of the framework, stuff like that. So when we see that, now it gives us opportunities to do focused training campaigns. We can actually engage with them one-on-one -on -one and, and, and tell them, hey, what's, what's your impediment? Why, why are you not doing this? Understand the pain points and see how we can go resolve that. So it gives us the ability to, to when those patterns emerge, go attack those patterns. And more importantly, as I mentioned earlier, when the pull request is submitted and the code review happens, we now have a security bot at the table. We're a small team, uh, so we can't be in all the scrum teams and, and during all code reviews, but at least we're, developers are starting to ask questions. There's a comment there, and they take that seriously. So that's, that's if you've got to have that as part of the culture, that a pull request-based uh, development happens, and there will be two different people reviewing, you know, one submitting, and at least one or more reviewing the code, and then merging the code. So you've got to have that, and now security culture is now part of that. And more importantly, what matters most, end of the day, is are we shipping secure products to our customers? So that, that's what really matters at the end of the day. All right, so here are some, uh, as you can see, some Slack uh, comments on our uh, Slack channel. Our developers love it. Of course, we've, we've made mistakes and we've got some uh, negative feedback and constructive criticism, but that's actually helped us improve the product, shape it correctly, and, and um, that's really helped us along the way. And uh, developers, you know, we, we understand developers, we're all developers ourselves, and so it's worked out pretty well. Now, let's go to the hard data. So here you can see uh, a few different programming languages. And uh, here I'm showing like C++ is our legacy stack. And so not too much velocity there. About 1,000 pull requests. Uh, an average of about 15 uh, findings uh, from a period of April 17, 2017 through uh, August. As you can see in the, in the graph, it, it has trended down. So when developers see this, they start fixing this, and, and, and a clear pattern emerges that they're not making those mistakes over and over again. 
and uh, we're, we're starting to catch less and less issues. It's now become part of their, uh, it's, it's kind of second nature to them. So that's really helped move the needle. So now we can start adding newer checks and start driving maturity um, up. So uh, if you go all the way across the time and we take performance seriously, we want to stay less than one second. By the time the webhook hits score bottom, the time we post a comment back, it should be less than one second, and, and we're, we're pretty performant. And we have about 25 different uh, security checks within Scorebot. So that's some, some real work data for you. All right, before I uh, open it up for questions, I have two things to say. So even though we built Scorebot to find PayPal-specific vulnerabilities, uh, our goal is to actually open source this at some point probably next year, uh, but we got some work to do. We wanna build a generic rules engine that makes it easy for you, for other companies to build some rules and deploy it. So our hope is to actually do that uh, sometime in the future. And two, we're always looking for great talent. We're hiring. Um, <laughs> feel free to pick me uh, after the talk. All right, with that said, I'm gonna open it up for questions. Yeah, mostly around our own custom frameworks, libraries, APIs, uh, logging infrastructure, stuff like that. Follow-up question. Uh, you mentioned that you're not running any kind of components now. You just have static analysis. So they are, you also have... Uh, correct, correct. Scorebot is just one aspect of it. So if, if we do it, where to stop the command DR security scan, it will run the whole suite, static analysis, dynamic analysis, software composition analysis. We have some custom checks in our, in our build, uh, and then scorebot also would be invoked. And, and DevRunner enables that to run seamlessly across uh, a developer's workstation, Windows or Mac, in the CI CD pipeline, and in our Mesos cluster where we run daily scans of all of our apps. And so, it, and all of our security tooling is containerized, uh, they're all Docker containers, so just dynamically download, no install, uh, or c configuration required, just works. Yeah. Yeah, developers use that a lot, because they don't want to be part of our metric system. Uh, when they, you know, <laughs> you know yeah. when they, inc they introduce a lot of security vulnerabilities, and, and they want something like this to trigger and find and fix it before they initiate a PR, so they love it. Yeah. You had a question? Yeah, so we have the commit IDs. So uh, as Vidu said, every time a PR comes in, we log a bunch of metadata. And so we track those commit IDs through the deployment. So we are able to track what's going on. Yeah. There was some question there. Yeah. Um, she got, okay. Any other questions? Also, yep. Like yeah, yeah, so it, it, it's not, it's, it's built, in the, the, we built it for PayPal. And so before we open source it, that's why I said we, we have some work to do in terms of building a generic rules engine that anybody can use. Uh, but the key thing is, there, is that not all vulnerabilities are amenable to static analysis. Some vulnerabilities can be only found dynamically, right? And so vulnerabilities that can be statically found are the ones that you wanna focus for scorebot. And that's how it's built. Any other questions? Yes, Eric. It is, it is static analysis. Yeah. A bunch of semantic checks, stuff like that, yes. And then second, um, it provides guidance for the developer how to fix the issue. Yep. How do you manage that knowledge base then? Yeah, it comes from different teams. Um, so like for example, this is, this is from our crypto team, obviously. Uh, it's a deprecated crypto API that they're trying to get rid of and move to a more modern API. So the guidance actually comes from them. Um, but most of the knowledge base is governed through our team. Like if it, if it were something that we can work with our, uh, our framework teams, our, our logging, logging platform owners, we work with them, make sure that the solution is solid. We test it and then we provide the recommendation to the developers. So we're the gatekeepers and we review and vet every, every recommendation that goes to it and we maintain that knowledge base. Yes.
uh, this is a custom uh, static analysis. So it'll ship with it, and, and, and of course you can, you can replace it with something else if you want to. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. All right, great, thank you very much.